All right, we are going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. If everybody could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, so the first item on our agenda is a discussion item. It's the return to school updates. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Jones, and then we'll get an update from our policy committee. Great, thank you. I'll just hit a couple of the highlights um, based off of our the plan we had last year that's carried forward to this year with obviously some uh, slight adjustments. First of all, we do have uh, the mask mandate, which is the, by the governor's order. So we will have that at least through September 30th as of today. Um, we are still socially distancing. As um, a reminder, last year, we used the American Pediatric Association three feet, um, where some other districts did not. So this is not a change for us. CDC and everybody has now come out and said uh, three feet uh, where feasible. Cohorting is something that we will still be doing uh, just for contract tracing more than anything. It's probably the most important in our elementary level uh, where we don't have the vaccine and um, little ones it's, are, are more difficult like on playgrounds and areas like that. Um, but we are a little bit looser in middle school in that I'll just give one example at Eastern. We had nine different cohorts last year, which had a lot of impacts to their elective schedule. So this year we're going by grade and team and we're able to have more of a normal just elective schedule. Uh, transportation, transportation looks like it did last year. We're still encouraging parents that are able um, to drop their children at school to keep the numbers down on the buses. We are required by federal law to wear a mask on the bus. And we have reset the protocols at the request of many of our parents. Can we reinforce that the bus drivers have the windows down? The kids really wanted the windows down, uh, making sure that they are socially distanced on the bus. So we're working with STA on that. Um, as far as our PPE, we've done, we have about 175,000 of reordering plus what we had last year. About masks. Um, this, these are um, masks. We have them available in every classroom. We have them in the entrances of the buildings. We have the hand sanitizer. We have the wipes, just restocking all of those things that help everybody feel a little bit safer. Um, food service, we are still under the USDA um, guidance where uh, all meals are provided at no cost and that's breakfast um, and also lunch. And we have continued throughout the summer delivering and making sure that we're also partnering and what I hope this is forever really with neighbor to neighbor and people that have really helped families in weekends and holidays and um, we've done a great job with that. Um, the cleaning, we are still doing our cleaning um, very thoroughly doing wipe down of surfaces, um, making sure we're getting disinfected every night. Um, and then last but not least is the quarantine and quarantines have changed slightly uh, from how individuals must quarantine and that's by CDC guidance. Also the Connecticut Department of Health is in agreement with that. And if you have specific questions about quarantine, I think Mary Keller is on, online tonight and I would let her answer those because she's better with the newer requirements than I am at answering those questions. So that's pretty much it. And so it's um, pretty much everything that we had last year with a, some slight tweaks according to the, the federal guidance and state guidance. All right, with that, uh, Ms. Downey, if you could give us an update from the Policy Governance Committee. Yes, I, I emailed all the board members. I hope everybody got it. We, Policy Governance, met the, today, um, notwithstanding that we do have the governor's mandate on masks, we thought it was important um, to give clarity to our families and our staff about what the expectations are. So we took last year's mask policy and went, all of us went through it and we looked at some issues that we might have and we really found it covered everything and just needed very minor revisions um, and then kind of a kind of more conforming or administrative kind of revisions. So in our proposal, we can't vote on it tonight because it's a special meeting. Um, we may have to have a meeting. Peter and I will talk about the process shortly before school starts in order to vote on it, to implement it as a policy for the first day of school, since we're not meeting again till September 9th otherwise, um, so that we have it in place for the start of the school year. But it, if you look at it, the one um, thing I'll draw your attention to is what we propose doing. 
is we put it in place for the duration of the school year, but there's a provision for the board to rescind or amend it. But we felt that in the interests of not spending an inordinate amount of time at our meetings talking about the issue, um, every meeting, if we kept doing it on a piecemeal basis, that wouldn't be wise, wouldn't be fruitful, wouldn't be a good use of our time. So our thought was to put it in place for the duration of the school year with the view that if we can, if we get to a point that we can cut back on it, we will do so and we as a board can do that. But it allows us to just move forward and focus on the matters of school and not these sorts of logistics. So I don't know if anyone has any questions or if everyone got a chance to look at it, but we won't, we can answer questions tonight, but we wouldn't be voting till another meeting. All right. Mr. Thank Kelly. you for that. Uh, question I have is just uh, simply, uh, how, if we want to quickly, for some reason, decide to stop it, it's just simply, we'll explain what we need to do in order to put it. In order to rescind it, we'd simply at any board meeting, someone make a motion to rescind the policy or amend the policy, and we would vote on it. It does not require, I don't think a rescission requires two reads. We could take action virtually instantaneously, just you know, for calling a meeting. Right, correct. It just needs to be added to an agenda. So let's say that the governor uh, declared that uh, no masks were no longer needed and all the health guidance was, was in the same place. We could schedule a meeting out 24 hours out and we could rescind the policy. Can we just add it to an existing meeting without, I know sometimes we have to add these things and it takes some sort of structure and procedure to do so. Would we be able to just inject it into a meeting that we're, we're scheduled to have anyway? Yep, we can, add, as long as we add it to the agenda within 24 hours of the meeting, or if it's not a special meeting, like special meetings, like tonight, we can't amend the agenda. Uh, if it's a regular meeting, a regular business meeting, yes, we could actually at that meeting, amend the agenda and add it. Well, that sounds pretty easy. Thank you. All right, Ms. Kowalski. So I, I have a, just a clarification question. So did the, what does the policy say without this change, whether, whether or not it's, when it's in effect or not into effect, because the way I understood it is that Dr. Jones and her administration had been following CDC guidance and um, Connecticut State Department of Health guidance relating to whether or not masks were, were essential. And it wasn't necessarily a decision that the board had continued to make. Now it seems that with this, amendment to the dis to the policy we're saying the board would take effect as to whether or not the policy the mask policy is thereby rescinded well last year when we were in the same situation that there was a governmental order we made a decision that we should have a policy because it provides clarity about what is and isn't a mask um, on what conditions they're required what the exemptions are so that entirety of the policy expired at the end of last year so, so we didn't have anything in place to even provide those guidelines. So we thought that it was better to have that in place in terms of if there's an issue, what that a gator doesn't count as a mask, for example, or that there are exemptions for recess, um, sorry, um, physical education classes. All those things are spelled out in our policy, which isn't really the level that the governor's order has gone into. So we thought that would be more helpful to families and staff to understand the expectations about communicating our expectations. And it was simply because we had nothing else in place otherwise, because last year's expired of its own nature. Okay, I hadn't realized that the policy itself had yeah, it. We made a decision last year to only keep okay. it in place through the end of the last academic year. So there was nothing existing for the current academic year. Okay, yeah, and I haven't seen the email this afternoon, so I'll have, I'll have to read okay, it. Okay, thanks. All right, Ms. Hirsch. Oh, also, in addition to answering Karen's question, um, Ms. Kwalsi, uh, sorry, is that um, the provision for the board to rescind if need be was in the policy last year as well. Um, the last paragraph uh, had a sunset clause for the end of last year's school year. And that's the only thing that was changed was the date in the last paragraph. That sunset clause um, it has remained the same uh, in the last paragraph. So last year, if things had changed, the board could change the policy as needed. And that's what that son, uh, that's what the provision that uh, uh, Ms. Downey was referring to is, it was in last year's as well. All right, other discussion? Uh, okay, I just have a question for Dr. Jones. Sure. And when you talk about the cohorting in elementary schools, you obviously last year was different than this year. Could you just kind of, for people who are watching who might be interested to understand, I did, I might have missed it in the town hall the other night, how the cohorting in elementary school is going to work. Um, elementary is a little bit easier because they have one teacher. 
uh, that they stay with other than their electives. And so they cohort by class, which that really isn't a change for K-5, but that's where we're being a little bit more cautious for, uh, because none of them are vaccinated. So, but it's not a huge change because it's by class. Ms. Kowalski. And how does that affect the ALP program for kids being pulled out with respect to cohorting? Yeah, that when the kids go to ALP, they're still in their ALP classroom. So when they get to, when they go to contact trace, they'll look at um, how close the students were together for how long was it when they're in the, the regular classroom was it when they were in the ALP room. Um, they do have what's called a super block this year, which is 90 minutes of STEM or 90 minutes of humanities, but it's a little bit different than we did last year, where kids would stay in for both of those super blocks. This year, they're, they're in for those areas where they qualified, unless they were in last year, did really well, and everyone felt like they could be in again this year, um, but they're still in a super block. So they do, there is some in and out. And another thing that you'll see this year depends on the building, how many classes they have. They may actually go to the actual art room, which we didn't do last year. We had people traveling. Um, if they're not having to use their art room for cafeteria, then they'll be able to go back to using it as art. And, and part of that was a teacher issue too. Our teachers feel more comfortable now because they've had an, an option to be vaccinated to feel a little bit safer. So then, so for example, let's say the art room at North Street, because that's the, the art room I know, um, kids will be able to go into Dr. Iosa's room for art at this point in time depends on the building if they can, if they have the space some of them in order to spread out we still are required six feet for lunch so it depends on how big the cafeteria is um, how many rotations they have how, how many students are in the building that have to rotate through lunch um, so each building is a little bit different um, they're they're trying their very best uh, but some of them if they have four sections on every grade level they really have to make the decision that we're still going to travel with art or we're going to be eating lunch at 10 a.m. And, and we didn't want to go in that direction where even when I was in a superintendent's call, some of the um, some of the communities are choosing to do a uh, brunch in the morning and snack later in the day because they're having the same issues. But we really want to have a lunch time. OK, and then one final question on that. Um, how will music look this year in each of the three grade level and the three in the th not three grade levels, but in um, elementary, middle, and high. Yeah, it should be as normal as possible with the exception of the PPE. We're still required um, to have like the bell covers and things of that nature and the spacing. So when you mean as, as normal as possible, do you mean our COVID normal of last year, except for the PPE or going back to normal 2019, but with PPE? Yes, that's trying to get back to the 2019 with PPE. I guess it's the new, new normal. Yeah. Ms. Hirsch. Not going there yet. Um, just to tag on, well, I had another question, but just to tag on, I assume that means that they'll also be having chorus again. Yes. Uh, but the question that I've been most asked, uh, or most people have reached out to me to ask, um, is in regards to quarantining um, and remote learning for students who are actually required by the district to quarantine, uh, especially at the middle and well, at the middle and the high school level, where missing a, a day or two of a, a class can really uh, make a negative impact for a student. How are we handling that? Will there be anything for them to dial into when that they're required to uh, quarantine? Um, the way that the legislation uh, was written, we can we can't have a remote school for K five or a full remote option for six twelve. That's not allowed by law. If we, as a school district, are quarantining a student, then we can still give them access. So we will still have the web camera in six through twelve. But what we're hoping is it would be total reverse of what we had last year, where as we got through, you know, a portion of the year, if you had 24 students on some days, you might have 18 who just decided to stay home and log in. Uh, and you might have four live in your classroom. This year, it should be the opposite because the only students that should be on the webcam are those students who are quarantined by the district. Um, and the K-5 will look just like it did last year. It's either the teacher live with the students, or if it's just a handful of students, they're working with those families individually like we did last year. So just, just to clarify, if a student is required to quarantine, they will be able, at, from 6 to 12, they will be allowed to dial in. And I don't know if Mary Keller wants to explain, I don't know what the differences are this year for the quarantine. Some parents weren't able to go onto the town hall. I mean, I watched it after, but she might have some extra details for people to know. Mary, it'd be helpful, I think, if you walk them through what, how the quarantine has changed. Sure. 
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Um, All right, Mary, it looks like you're muted. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think we're missing a speaker. Can, in the room. Hang on one second. I can hear Mary. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I think Mary you and I are both remote, and I think we can hear each other, but I don't think they can hear us. Okay, so I'm going one to. Second. We're, um, we're working through our technical okay. issues tonight. Mary, hold on okay. one second. We're just going to try to make sure they can hear you in the building. All right, Mary, can you give us a, uh, a shout out so we can see if it worked? Sure. Can you hear me? All right, we're going to try it the old fashioned way. I think the people on Zoom can hear you. I think the people in the room can't. Yeah. I'm going to. Oh, OK. All right, I'm going to do it through my computer. So go ahead and talk, and I will shut up. <laughs> OK, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. So <laughs> what was the question? No. Okay. Um, so <laughs> the, the quarantine um, of last year was different in elementary school than it was in a, in the older grades. And that was based on what we presumed was the length of time in the classroom, the um, activity level of the students, the seating of the students, the fact that we thought they wouldn't be wearing masks, um, you know, quite as uh, consistently as they did in the high school, and they talk in in elementary school, um, generally in middle school and high school, they wait to be called upon. So we would generally, or almost always, quarantine a class and sometimes even a grade, depending um, on what the mixing was during recess and lunch. But this year. Um, based on the studies by the CDC, if a child is exposed to another child, it is going to be within less than three feet distance. It's no longer a six foot um, uh, space between the this positive student and the other students, but less than three feet, if they're all wearing a mask, they're not considered exposed. And that's based on what the CDC studied they did not see a lot of transmission in, in stationary seating in the classrooms. We will, we've always done that in the high school classes. In the high school classes, we have always um, just quarantined those students that were immediately adjacent to the positive case at three, six, nine, and 12. Um, the difference also is that it is only for those students that are in stationary seating in the classroom. It doesn't include the teacher or anyone else in the classroom. So it is just for stationary seating around a classroom. It wouldn't, it, it wouldn't um, be used for say at lunch or at recess or athletics. It's, it's only based on the data they collected for the classroom. Now, the other change in quarantine is that we used to quarantine everyone for 14 days um, now we are using one of the alternative models and we are quarantining those exposed, those considered exposed for um, a total of eight days. If they test on day five after exposure, they can return on day eight. So that lessens the quarantine um, and it also lessens the number of students that were going to be considered exposed in quarantine. Did I cover anything else? The only, other, the only other thing I'd like to say is that for those students that are positive, it still remains an isolation of 10 days, always has and, and will continue to be that. Thank you, Mary. All okay. right, any other, Ms. Jo? Sorry, one more question. I'm sure this was answered on the town hall. Um, are there any travel restrictions? So if people are out other states and coming back. What's the story around that? I'm going to ask Mary to chime in on that one. We just updated that one about a week and a half right. ago. Okay. Right. The CDC, the CDC currently recommends for fully vaccinated people, no quarantine and no testing for um, domestic, um, no quarantine, no testing. If you are unvaccinated, you are asked to test um, on on day on day five <laughs> and quarantine, or I'm sorry, day three, four, five, 
and um, quarantine for seven days for domestic travel. It, internationally, everyone who um, goes on an international flight is asked to is asked to test before they get back on the plane or before they leave their their place of vacation and come back. They are asked to test again on day three to five once they've returned and to quarantine for um, for seven days after after they've returned. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Tony, I have to ask about sports. What are sports going to look like this fall? Um, sports look actually pretty much back to normal by CIAC. Um, you know, there's the, even the masking rule is different this year for us when we're outdoors. So when children are at recess in sports, they don't have to wear for outdoor sports. If they're inside, then there are certain times when they would wear masks, but much more back to normal this year. So that's good news for sports. Thank you. Ms. Kowalski, did you have something? Yeah, I just had a follow-up question for um, Ms. Keller, which is if the, on the travel restrictions and the CDC guidance for those children that are not vaccinated and they test on day three, four, or five negative, do they have to continue quarantining for seven days or can they come back to school? They have to continue to quarantine for seven days as recommended by the CDC. If they don't test, how long do they have to quarantine? 10 days. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Hearing none. Thank you very much. Obviously, we'll uh, keep watching because things change rapidly. Um, and obviously, please keep communicating to the community. All right. With Peter, that, I'm just to follow up to that. How do we want to just oh. we'll, we'll deal with whether voting on a mask policy or do we want to take that up at the end of the meeting in terms of any if there are any other issues we need to vote, deal well, with a vote why, on? Why don't we take that up now? We have a meeting scheduled for September 9th, but school starts actually the uh, sixth graders and ninth graders and uh, new kids to the district start on the 31st. So sometime between now and the 31st, we should probably have a vote on our we item. We cannot vote tonight. We unfortunately can we do a, um, are we do we have authorization mm -hmm. to do a meeting by electronic means or it has to be in person? Uh, we can do a uh, sort of a hybrid meeting so long as we have somebody in person, probably me. <laughs> so um, if you could all take a look at your calendars, uh, we need 24 hours notice to post so we couldn't do anything before Wednesday. So it'd be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday or Monday. And I don't know how long a meeting it would be. I mean, if you have comments on the policy, send them on to PGC, but uh, everybody could look, maybe we'll pick a day Thursday at maybe 5 p.m. Could do later if people need that accommodation for work. Anybody have any uh, problem with Thursday at 5 p.m.? Dr. Francis, I know you're online. If you could just give us a, uh, a sign. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, that works for me. Uh, we had a request for six. Dr. Francis, does six work for you? Uh, six is okay um, if it's not too long. Okay, we will do our best. Any, anybody mm -hmm. else have any objection to Thursday the 26th at 6 p.m.? That way Dr. Jones can get a note out in the uh, Friday update to parents. All right, this will be, uh, yeah, we'll get, you, we'll get you a Zoom link, we'll be online. So Thursday, 8, 26, 6 p.m. is our meeting for that. And I will work to get that notice tomorrow. All right, thank you. With that, we are gonna move on to our next discussion item, which is the GHS entryway. Thank you, Mr. Walker, for joining us. You can sit at that special little table at the end for you, the kids table. Uh, just to it's set the timeout chair, Steve. <laughs> Steve does not get the timeout chair. This is the first uh, read of this item. So uh, Mr. Walker will be uh, talking to us about what the building committee has been up to. Uh, we as a board per the charter have to vote on adopting the, uh, the design elements. Um, we will take that vote at our September 9th meeting. So with that, Mr. Walker, if you want to go ahead. Peter, I believe he has to push to talk. Oh, sorry. All right, sorry. You have to hold it down. I have to keep it held down while I talk? 
Okay. Hopefully uh, the technology of our new entryway will be better. Um, I will walk through each and every one of the, the slides uh, relatively quickly. Uh, I think pictures do speak for themselves, but I do wanna give you uh, some flavor behind it. And then I'll take any questions also with us uh, on the screen should be uh, 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 Dean and David from Silver Petroselli. And um, in the audience is Louis Contadino and Maureen Bonanno, uh, two committee members. Um, Michael, are you able to bring the document up on the Zoom? I have it as a PDF. I don't know if the um, the firm has it as a PowerPoint and would like to share their screen. Either way would work. I don't think they've got it. So if you just bring the PDF up just so people online can see what we're talking about. Okay, uh, slide one uh, after the cover slide is the rendering of what the building committee has uh, recommended. This was our scheme for option one. That's what we refer to it as. Um, we went through several iterations and that's what I'm gonna walk you through tonight, just to let you uh, get a, a glimpse of what we've been doing for the past several months with the architect. Um, you will see that uh, the entryway in, um, uh, will be both uh, ballistic and uh, bomb proof, if you will. Um, other than that, I don't want to go into a lot of the security details for obvious reasons. If you have questions at any time, I'm certainly happy to discuss those with you. Uh, but we are very sensitive about what information we're putting out there to the general public regarding this building. Um, you can see a, a different uh, view of this in slide. Uh, I guess this is slide three. Again, scheme four, option one. One of the things you will see is the overhang. We thought it wise to have um, some protection from the elements as you exit the uh, atrium um, so that obviously if you're waiting for a bus and, and the door is sort of locked behind you, there's still some protection there for you. I'm gonna walk through a couple of the schemes so that you understand where a lot of the debate uh, was around. And that had, once we picked a scheme, we then looked at several options. So this option, uh, cylindrical columns, they, they're throughout the school. And so this, this sort of mirrored what was in the school already. Then uh, you have sort of a bowed uh, uh, column option. This moved the columns closer to the atrium. The feeling was if, if uh, at least relative to this option, we wanted to see what it would look like uh, to having the columns be uh, far away from the atrium uh, for the kids exiting and or entering. Uh, option four of scheme four, you have uh, wooden columns again, but on a straight line as opposed to a diagonal or on an angle, uh, and that would be solid uh, wood. And then option five are uh, very skinny columns, again, to almost try to hide them so that you don't, you don't really see them at all. And then <clears throat> option six is there are no columns. This would take a little bit more engineering, maybe a little bit uh, more cost, but uh, doable from an engineering standpoint. Um, it, it, a lot to the committee, this looked like just a, a roof sort of placed on top of a glass box in it. And from the various perspectives, um, while I think people, uh, committee members would have liked to have seen no columns in general, it, it, it didn't seem like it flowed with the entirety of the building. We also looked at an option where the columns would be V uh, shaped, but then uh, with that, if you then go to that rendering with the canopy, what it would look like if you extended uh, a canopy even farther out for even more protection. Um, and the committee in general did not like this scheme or option because it, it just seems to take away from the feeling that you had a true entrance to this building. So how did we get to scheme four? Well, <clears throat> Uh, if you turn the page, it, you, you had scheme one, which was the original scheme presented by the architects who were the same architects for the feasibility study, just so you all know we, or you do know because you helped uh, us select them. Um, uh, Silver Petroselli helped the feasibility study and now are helping us with this. Um, and this was effectively what they uh, came up with. And we, we talked a lot about this. I would say that this overall scheme uh, garnered a lot of support and, and probably was, if there was a ranking, which there wasn't, but probably garnered the second most support. A lot of the, the there was a lot of feeling that the, the ceiling itself was great. It, it looked like it was floating. The committee had a real issue with the, the right side or what we called the waterfall. 
um, in that it, it obstructed a view from that perspective. Kids are coming in from where the, uh, the um, uh, music space is, and it just didn't, it didn't feel like it flowed like uh, Scheme 4 did. Uh, scheme 2 uh, was an option. It, it pushed the security desk all the way to the right as opposed to what's on the left. And I'll go through that in a second once we get to the interior. Um, and it just looked boxy and not really what the committee was looking for in terms of um, a, a welcoming entrance uh, for the school. Scheme three, uh, very, very nice looking. It, it had a lot of elements. Uh, probably the biggest takeaway from scheme three is it was going to be uh, likely to be a lot more costly. The, uh, the curvature of the roof, I don't know if you can see in the background to the right, you had a separate, um, uh, it was a botanical uh, scenario where you, we were building a glass structure there for the tree. Um, it just was, it, it, it just, it sounded expensive. And, and the architects agreed that that was probably the most expensive. Also the, the notion, while it looks interesting and, and um, architecturally stimulating from this angle, when you put it up against the entirety of the building, it, it didn't necessarily feel like it, it flowed with the rest of the building. Um, scheme five was, was interesting. It pulled the students in from the right. So you didn't come in actually from the, where you're looking faced on right now, it turned the entrances towards where the bird is there, um, the Cardinal. So, uh, I don't think the committee really desired to shift where the front entrance would be. Scheme six, um, scheme six had a lot of, uh, commentary, um, a lot larger volume of a room. And so from a maintenance and from a um, ongoing utility standpoint, cost of utilities, it's a much bigger space to cool and to heat. And so while it does give you that grandeur of um, a front entrance and it, and unlike any of the others, it doesn't, doesn't pop out at you as a school necessarily, but almost as a, a piece of art itself. Um, and while it had uh, some favorable comments at the end of the day, just looking at the practicality of it, uh, the committee uh, moved on from scheme six. So with that, let me talk a little bit about uh, schemes for interior, which by the way, effectively could be the interior for any of those exterior schemes. The box is the box. We really concentrated on what it would look like from the ceiling. So this is, this is all the way, if you're facing the front entrance, all the way to the left, you have your main office and that's where you have to be buzzed into right from the uh, atrium. And then you have the security desk. One of the major points that came up during our meeting was whether or not you should enclose the security desk with, with security glass. Um, it was the feeling of the committee that this is a, this is a big deal, uh, if you will. This is, it's not in the ed specs. So we're not, you didn't tell us as a committee, you have to have security glass in your building. Um, a lot of commentary uh, regarding how it would change the look, the feel, the environment at the school, the interaction between your security personnel and the students. And so we really felt it's really up to the Board of Ed to, to give us some direction. So we would ask that not only are we here to ask for your um, approval, uh, you're the one who ultimately approves the design, but in this particular case, we're also asking for part B, which is, do you want us to build the building, uh, the security desk with glass? And the next scheme shows the security without the glass. And again, if the glass is up, there would be a drawer or something you would be able to transact as a visitor. Uh, but the sense of the, some members of the committee would be that, that um, that's not how Greenwich High School operates. And, and do you want that? Now, um, I call this, to your attention just because, just so that everybody's crystal clear on how this atrium will work from the outside. In the, in, for the beginning of school, kids would enter in as they do now and there would be floods of kids coming in. As soon as uh, school start time begins, all doors get locked except the door closest to this um, security desk, which is if you're facing the atrium all the way to the left, the visitor would, or, or the late student would enter in there have to communicate with the security personnel and then would then get buzzed into the main office. And, and I'll, there's a slide for that. Now you see a ramp there because if, I know you've all walked the, the glass corridor, there actually is a 10 inch rise in the glass corridor. So 
we we are going to need to have that slight ramp there. Um, this is all ADA compliant. Um, and in fact, the way this design works is it's both ADA compliant from the top of the um, uh, ramp and the lower half of the ramp. Um, and at that point, the security personnel, both for the late student and or the visitor would buzz them in. And then we'll get to the side where you enter into the lobby of what is the main office, which is also getting redone. And again, all of, all of this interior work would be the same with any of the schemes. But as you can see, at least in the picture that I'm looking at, it's without the glass. Um, th that's what we have. I will also say that the architects indicated that the trend is more for glass enclosures for your security personnel. And so this is really a matter of um, preference of what the district wants and how they want to operate. Um, you also now look, here's another view from the security personnel looking out with the security glass uh, and then without. And that's what the atrium would look like. Don't, don't get hung, too hung up on the, the lights that are hanging from there. We still have to uh, deal with that. We have to deal with the, with the, with the mullions that are in the glass. It might not be that. We're, we're looking more for a, a more seamless glass setting, not that big stark white. So we hope to, to really make it impressive that way, but we'll, we have a lot of tweaking to do. Um, <clears throat> the last slide is the interior and a lot of work is being done on the interior uh, administration. Um, we had uh, Ralph Mayo work with the architects um, and, and seek input from his staff. And so what you would do is from the, the security desk, would, you would, the security personnel would enter the security desk from the lobby, uh, the new uh, created lobby. Um, then as you could see, you would come in from the atrium, I'm, I'm from the gray area into the new lobby and that's where visitors and students alike. Then you have a new, um, desk for the, uh, uh, the front desk is now it's all low desks for everybody and your lobby from the glass corridor would remain. So students can always still use that. What we then did is took that space and reconfigured down below that front lobby area to configure it to be consistent with what the current needs of the school are. Um, and the building committee, um, while reviewed this and asked questions about it, uh, really wanted and, and obtained the input from administration regarding those rooms, quite frankly, because they're the ones who are using them and they have the best information relative to how it can be used in the most efficient manner. At every stage, there are either doors or buzzers that can be locked. Um, and so presumably though, Anybody who gains access to the atrium, that's where, the, that's where it stops until they're cleared to come in uh, and, enter the, and enter the school from that perspective. So with that, um, I will take any questions that you have um, and move the process along. Ms. Downey, I don't know if you wanna speak. Yeah, as a member of the committee, I think Steve articulated everything perfectly. I mean, the committee did a lot of work. We had a lot of meetings this summer and put a lot of thought into all the different designs, different options, and there were a lot of points of views. And I think ultimately really there was a consensus from the group about the way to proceed on both the interior configuration and the exterior design. Stu? Um, I wanted to see one more option because I don't think there were enough choices, but um, the, obviously the committee did a wonderful job and I think it's a It'll be great. And I'm excited with my oldest entering high school that hopefully he'll get to see this. So that goes to timing. Can someone just tell me, um, we give you our thoughts tonight. Hopefully you hire and you're what, when are we actually doing this? So you, your vote would be to vote on the design, the scheme, if you will. Um, like I said, we have a lot of work to do with that, the design engineering, also looking at cost. And just so you know, we don't have costs yet on any of this, but we did ask the architect if these, all of the schemes would fall into the budget and, and they agreed that it would especially scheme for, that's the one we're, we're keying in on now. Um, assuming it gets approved now, we then go to the design phase and, and then get schematic drawings and then onto construction drawings. Um, and we're looking, it will, we do have a schedule that gets us started next year. And the goal would be to start earlier and and be able to get it open for the, I'm gonna get these dates wrong, I know I am, uh, the fall of 2023, 22, no, 22. The, the, the timeline 
it, which was, it, it seemed kind of aggressive, but and now we're, we're kind of a little bit under the gun, which is why to the extent we have are, are in a position to vote on it on September 9th to keep the project moving. But I think we wanted the shovel hit the ground in February. So, Cause we're either, it's, it's a six month, yes. It's about a six month project ish. Um, but we're, so we're either gonna lose the start of school or the end of school, right? So I think the view was bidding it sooner, um, getting it going in the spring to be open for beginning a school next fall would be the, the target plan. Obviously, we won't know till we bid it and have, have our construction drawings, whether that's doable. The other, just so the yeah, contingency indeed. planning is, if, if, if we know we're not hitting the early part of September, then we have to really think hard about whether we just push it to not, not have it affect this school year, start it right after, and then affect the next school year. So we're trying to minimize the interruption. And we'll have to make that determination as we go along. But as of right now, it's to interrupt the winter slash spring of this year and have it available fall of next year. So a follow up on that. What about land use approvals? When would that process start? It, starting now. We know we need variances. You know, every time we touch everything, we need variances. We need a variance for this. And we'll be, as soon as we get approval of the design, that's what that's what we'll get started on. And I guess we'd have to go for a uh, MI from the selectmen, right? I'm just uh, dusting off the cobwebs in my brain. So you, you've got a uh, lengthy process ahead of you in that, in that respect too. Um, just, I guess I'll, I'll quickly give my comments. Uh, one, I missed the Cardinal from the original design. I, I get why the walls where they are kind of aren't making it very inviting. Uh, this is, though, our opportunity to, I don't know, try to blend the building back together because it's basically multiple styles. We heard that when we went with the stadium and even the ticket booth became a uh, subject of discussion. How do you how do you kind of bring it into the design of the school? But I, I'd love to see a way to get the Cardinal back if we could, because I think we're missing that. In terms of the the security glass for the uh, for the guard station, I guess, is there the possibility of, of setting it up so that it's something we could install in the future? Uh, that maybe we could try it for a while without it because I, I would love to not have it. I, I just think it's not a warm, welcoming environment. If we if we start throwing up security glass, right, then you'll start to get the metal detector question in the next. And I don't I don't want to go down that road. I don't think that's the kind of high school we have. So, if Dean or David are on, my my instinct tells me yes, but I'm not the builder or the architect. So, uh, if Dean or David, is it easy enough for you to respond to that? Yeah, I can um, I can respond to that, Steve. Absolutely, it can be designed so that it can be installed at a later date. Um, as you can see in the renderings, the glass really sits in a subtle frame, and that frame will be mounted to the desktop and also to the ceiling. So as long as we structure the ceiling and the desk to accommodate that in the future, it absolutely can come at a later date. Thank you for that. All right, Dr. Francis and then Ms. Hirsch. Can you hear me? Yes. Yay. Okay. A uh, couple of questions. So I just was trying to see in the drawings, it looks like the security guard has to go back into the lobby and then out through those doors and then down the ramp if they want to get to the vestibule. So if there's something going on in the vestibule, they kind of have to go around to get in there. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Does that seem like a good idea? You're basically losing sight of what you're concerned about in the vestibule to get out to deal with it. Our our understanding, and again, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on the security um, framework or protocols, but my understanding is that the uh, there's more than one security, especially during the high traffic times. Uh, there are other areas that they're protecting and patrolling, and and um, we're we're confined to some degree with having enough space for all of the monitors that need to go in and be protected uh, from, from view other than uh, the security personnel. And so a design that would say like it would have a gate or something there would really constrict us to um, with those monitors. And so I, I think from the architect standpoint, that wasn't a heavy lift to, to either walk around or, get over the, the desk, but. Okay. Um, and then the point well taken, we'll, we'll take it up with the committee where our work isn't okay. done. So 
Okay. Uh, point well taken. And then there's if the fence that we can see in this slide, if you're seeing the same thing I am, is that because it's a ramp to get up to the main office? Is that why you have that fence there? That's correct. There's by code, we need a handrail on both sides uh -huh. of the okay. ramp. So when people come in, they're then going to have to go around that fence to then get into the building. That's correct. correct. Okay. Um, you know how long that fence is? The, the railing, the railing, again, it's uh, Dean or David, if you could tell the exact feet, but you, you have to obviously be, co be ADA compliant. And so it's 10 inches that you're going up. So visually, I, I think it's, you also want to make it wide because you want to make it inviting. You don't want to make this narrow uh, entrance way. So you really want the front entrance also to the office to be inviting. Right, but how much of the flow are you blocking for people walking in from the front and trying to get into the glass corridor? It, that, it, that ramp is about 10 feet long. Okay, so not that long. No, and um, what it also allows is that it, um, it sort of segregates the visitors as they do come in and forces them to go around to the office. So it sort of corrals them, at least the visitors piece, but the students that will be coming in um, in morning uh, or at the end of the day, they have an obstructed view walkway through. So this is really also intended just to corral the guests that are coming into the security desk. I guess the assumption is that students won't come in that door. So people Correct. going straight through would not be coming through there. Um, Correct. I'm sorry, can I keep going with two other uh, questions? Sure, go ahead. Um, the, this is hearkening back to prior, look, my, back in my day conversations. Um, we had talked about two things potentially around that entrance area. And I, I realize those are not happening now, but I'm wondering if this design would impede them in the future. One was having a second floor passage for the glass corridor. And the other was potentially eventually having the media center moved to the other side. Is there anything about this design that would impede either of those things from happening or that would have to be revised in the next round? I don't believe anything would need to be modified in this design to accommodate those two requirements, okay. either, either now or in the future. Okay. Thank you. All right, Ms. Hirsch. Uh, well, first of all, thank you guys for working so hard through the summer on this. I, I know how hard that can be, and you guys did a great job. Uh, Gaetan, thank you for asking one of my questions about uh, the second story, if we need to add one. Um, so that, that brings me down to actually two questions then. Um, well, much like Mr. Bernstein, I sort of miss, and I'm sure we can create something to highlight that it's Greenwich High School, but um, you know, we, we, I miss the Cardinal in the original design, but um, I have two questions on the design itself. So uh, so now that the, student, you know, the, the new entryway people get the visitors get buzzed in into the office and then have to walk through the front of the office in order to get into the school if they're not stopping in the office is that correct they come in if you're looking at the front of the scheme they come in through the doors all the way to the left the desk is right there they they turn to the left they go to the desk if you look at the interior view then they would get buzzed they would walk around the um the railing go up the ramp then get buzzed into the front office and be in the front office. So for visitors who are, for instance, um, PTA volunteers and are volunteering in the ho in houses during the week, would walk through the office and then back out into the class quarter. Presumably, I mean, in. that's a more of a logistics question. For, so if yeah, that, I don't that, that the, right now is what the we've been told the process will be, if that's not the process in the future, there are other there are other ways to handle people and access. Yeah, I think we didn't get down to that level of detail in terms of which door a volunteer would go. And it was just more the point that someone's going to check in at the security desk. And I do think the administration might say we don't want people coming, you know, coming through the lobby if they're volunteers versus I, I think that's an operational. No, the only question is if there's no other way, if you get it buzzed in that way to get into the school, like into the, uh, into the well, school. Well, there's the three through. sets of doors into the glass corridor. Right. But if you're a parent that's getting buzzed in during the day, you're buzzed in through the security that goes and then into the office and then into the school from there. The only reason I'm asking the question is, will that be disruptive um, to the office personnel that's there? 
I'm not sure it has necessarily has to happen because if a student comes late and checks in, they don't have to go through the office. So there are those extra set of doors. I don't know, Dean, David, I didn't see thoughts? an extra set of doors from that, that, that uh, security clearance. There's three sets of doors into the glass corridor. The, the simple answer is I think it's a good point raised. We will make sure that there is access, being able to access doors, open them from the desk, both to the front office and to the glass corridor. I'm sorry. When I saw that once they got buzzed in, I thought they just went into that other little cubicle that was right in front of the office. That's how I read it. I didn't realize then they're buzzed into the larger section that they can just enter the corridor. Okay. Second question is, is I know we don't know exactly the timing as to when this will happen, but if there is construction uh, occurring while the students are in school, um, I would suppose that we are going to be very cognizant, especially in the spring, if their uh, students are doing testing like SAT, uh, school day SAT or AP exams and things like that, so that the um, noise and disruptions are minimized for them. Um, and the other question then becomes is, while this is under construction, how will we be uh, having our students and our guests enter the school building, um, you know, to, again, just a clarification, did we figure out a, an alternate while they're doing construction? We have not. We will. We have not up to this point. I have full faith in you. Mr. Kelly. I have two questions and a statement. Question number one, uh, you say uh, it is ADA compliant. Is that ADA compliancy for both students and employee? Yes. Yes. Statement, uh, no security glass at the front desk. Last question, how many square feet are we adding to the uh, high school? Um, you can see it on the right of the summary of a square foot. It's 2,265 square feet. Thank you. Uh, one comment that keeps on recurring as well is the notion of the cardinal. Um, I, Again, our presentation is not giving you all of uh, all of what we were privy to, but I can say there's a there's a a lip that's from the glass. This is obviously a taller structure than the current glass corridor, and there's a the it's there's a natural lip there. And one of one of the renderings uh, that the architects put together was they illuminated that, uh, and behind there was a, a, in big block letters Greenwich High School in red. Um, pretty impressive. Again, uh, we do have some artistic uh, individuals on our committee and, and they are looking at how to uh, not just make this an entrance to the high school, but make this an entrance to a facility that whether they have um, concerts or what have you. And so uh, we are looking at that aspect of it. We understand and appreciate our first and foremost uh, goal is to build a secure front entrance. Um, but we also realize that it's a front entrance that Greenwich High never had. And so we take that uh, with great seriousness and, and we do appreciate your comments in general about making sure that it's also um, something that is visually pleasing, including recognizing that it's a high school. Great. All right, if there's no other discussion, we will take this up for action at our September 9th meeting. If you have questions in the meantime, you can pass them to Christina. Otherwise we will be voting on uh, the design. It's scheme four, option one. Thank, Thank you, you so Steve. much. Appreciate it. All right, resetting. The next item on our agenda are the superintendent goals. If you give me a minute, I got to work between two documents here. Uh, Dr. Jones, I want to thank you for sending in your goals. I co collected some um, comments from some board members. I will try to take them by topic. I will pause, see if anybody has anything to add to that, and then we can go uh, one by one. So the first was the curriculum goal. Um, I think uh, Ms. Kowalski, you sent something in about the achievement gap. I don't know that that fits there. It should be a separate goal and uh, I'm open to suggestion from Dr. Jones. Also on this topic, Ms. Hershey had a whole lot of stuff, but I think some of it was already subsumed in what Dr. Jones had. So Karen uh, Kowalski, maybe I'll turn to you first. I don't know if you think it belongs here as separate standalone. Uh, we can take it as a standalone if you want. It's up to you. Yeah, I I think I'd prefer it as a standalone because I think we have different issues with respect to curriculum, right? The idea of curriculum is maintaining a uniform curriculum across the 15 schools and making sure that it's implemented um, strategically and the same across the whole board as opposed to, and, and then on 
added to that is making sure that teachers have the adequate resources for curriculum purposes, which I think is entirely separate and different from addressing the achievement gap that the Lincoln material that we saw last year showed that we have a number of kids in various schools and grade levels that are not, um, you know, not where they need to be. And I don't think those can be commingled because I think they're two separate issues. Fair, fair enough. So I've already got that in the parking lot and we will come back to the achievement gap. I don't know, Ms. Hirsch, if you wanted to add anything on curriculum. Much like uh, Karen, I know we need to sort of focus on improving educational outcomes for all of our students and um, evaluating some of the curriculum and assessments and instruction. Um, I know Dr. Jones had mentioned some, uh, has another goal at the bottom in regards to link it. Um, but I really do think one of the things that we discussed was focusing on the alignment across schools and establishing a, establishing a consistent structure from pre-K eight curriculum, um, as well as aligning that vertically to the high school. Um, I really do feel like, you know, in addition to some of the other things I noted, um, that we should really establish a review process for curriculum materials um, through the curriculum council. Um, and I think that that would be one of the ways that, you know, one of the things we can certainly add is how to um, go through that. We do have a review cycle, but I think that that would be really important um, for us to discuss. Um, and I think, and again, once we get to link it, it'll be a way for us to use our data to sort of look at how to address that achievement gap as well and any other learning loss. All right, and if you want to email that to Dr. Jones, if you can update these with the name of that for next week, that would be for the ninth, that would be great. Uh, the next one is uh, ALP. Oh, yep, sure, go ahead, Gaetan. I just, on, because it's sort of a follow-up to Karen's, I think just, I, I think this is what Karen was saying, but just to reiterate, I feel like, you know, we have had sort of this process of <clears throat> the review, the refresh, the, you know, there's a bunch of different terms of sort of what the curriculum goes through. And then there was this, the summer institutes, which I think a lot of that has been changed. And I know I'm, I'm kind of old school in terms of being out of the loop for a couple of years, but I think to really clarify exactly what the steps are for that. And I, I see that you're sort of aligning it to the budget, but I think making sure, and maybe I've missed it, maybe this has happened, but making sure that there's a very clear process um, and the role of the curriculum committee in that process, um, I think would be good to include in that. Yeah, I, no, um, Dr. Francis, I think that's the right way to do it. I don't think the curriculum should be driven by the budget. I think we need to set out the steps and procedures and postures of how this should be come about and where, and so that there's something to, you know, a metric in which we can tie it to, to say that it's been achieved. Yeah, I was going to say, and in regard to reviewing, defining curricular goals. I'll let I call on yeah. you first. Thank you, Ms. Hirsch. Order. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on then. Uh, the next item is ALP. Um, personally, and I think Ms. Kowalski, your, your comment uh, by email earlier to Dr. Jens about, right? I, I don't think what you, I think ALP is, is something that ought to be looked at. I don't think you've got the goal right. Um, I don't think the board had consensus with the report that was submitted last year. We certainly didn't take any action to adopt those outcomes that were suggested because I don't think they, I don't think we agreed with that. So I, I think it's something worth looking at whether it needs to be a goal or not. I guess I'm, I'm open to at this point, but I, I think the goal ought to be, you need to look at that program with fresh eyes, make sure that it's got the resources it needs, that it's implemented in the right way. I know you talked earlier about the super blocks. That is a change that got made. That's a good change. Um, but I don't think that report was the be all end all. And I don't want that to be your goal because that wasn't where the board was going. I don't know if anybody else wants to add something, Ms. Hirsch. Yeah, I was just going to echo what Mr. Bernstein said. We got that report at the end of January and I know the board was had, had a bunch of questions and nothing has come back to us since then. Um, I think this is something that would be more of a board goal as a discussion uh, for us as a board. Um, I think we really need to define as a board what it is that we want uh, the ALP, what, what the ALP program is and what we feel it's the needs it's supposed to be meeting. It is, in my mind, a, a similar to a special education program, but it is, so it, it meets unique, the needs of unique students. Um, but we never, as a board, really got to discuss that and define it. Um, and I don't think we had alignment um, on anything from that report. So um, I, I would agree with Mr. Bernstein. This is not something that I thought would be a goal for this year, um, even though we do need some revisions there. All right, Ms. Stowe, and then I'll come to you, Ms. Kowalski. 
Yeah, I think we, this board is obviously very focused on, um, I mean, ALP is a real gem and we're lucky to have it in Greenwich because not all school districts have this gifted program. Um, certainly we heard from Bonnie O'Regan that there are some changes that need to be made. And I know that COVID changed some things. Certainly the selection process changed a bit. Um, so I'd like us to look at it, but I do think it maybe should be a board goal rather than a super goal. Cause I think it's something that's important to all of us to be focused on. Okay. Yeah, and I would just add, there's been a reference to a PT that, you know, part of there was a commitment made to a PTA subcommittee and obviously, you know, no disrespect to the, to the subcommittee, but I do agree with Ms. Stowe that there should be more board interaction with this, as well as if there is a committee that is created through the PTA specifically to look into ALP and have a review of it, that there be a liaison with the with a board member, because I think all of us have been very outspoken on this and feel very strongly about the ALP program. All right, Dr. Francis. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure I have a strong opinion about whether it's a superintendent goal or a board goal, but um, I, I did look and I think we've got the meeting coming up in October I think it would be really wise for us as a board to kind of have the conversation about what it is that we see ALP as. I think similar to sort of the concept, and we've talked about, and I know Steve, Peter Schur had been talking about this before, of, you know, for SPED, kind of what is state of the art? What are What is out there that's felt to be, you know, the, the best way to, to teach advanced students? Um, you know, what do we see as a board as the goals? Um, so I do think those are important things, and I and I think it might behoove us to think about what it is that we want to get out of that report in October, um, so that that can be a, a good starting point in terms of how to move forward. Thank you. All right, next up is the uh, special education audit. Uh, thank you for including that because if you hadn't, we all would. Um, I, I think the uh, the only thing I would have to add, and I, I don't know, Karen, I've got your notes in front of me too, just uh, ensuring that regular updates are given to the board, which we've already got calendar, but also the community. Uh, I know that there's going to be a timeline that's going to be public, but you know, using the district newsletter to let all parents know, as well as the special education newsletter that uh, that's already happening. So. I don't know if there was anything else anybody wanted to add on special education, but obviously that's a uh, important topic for the year. All right, seeing none, moving on to data and management systems. Um, so one comment I got about this, and uh, if I get it wrong, Dr. Francis, weigh in, uh, was just, I you've got link it there, but it's really about making sure uh, families understand how their students are doing. Um, you know, we used to complain about the star reports. Uh, that's just one element of it, but obviously Link it's there to help with this. So hopefully you can continue to grow on the, uh, the use of data with families so they can see uh, where, prog where progress is happening. Ms. Hirsch. I would just like to add to, again that not just the community, but that we also are getting regular updates. As I know last year, you guys had to, a year to learn to use the program and system, but we have had no data to see how our students are doing. So I'd like to add just like in that area, communication uh, as well as regular updates. Ms. Kowalski. And I'd like to also follow up on the request that I had made originally when we got the link at data to get a more detailed and granular breakdown to, on what that data was showing us per school, per student. My understanding is that in years past, we've gotten annual reports about where that stood. And I'd like to reiterate that request um, again to get that data that we've been asking for. It's a request, but obviously we're focused on super goals, but I know Tony's made a note. Um, all right, next up, uh, COVID safety. So obviously continued communication with the community has got to be a big part of what you do this year. We know that. I don't know if it's really spelled out enough in there. Uh, you know, the continued monitoring of the pandemic and implications for things like student attendance, achievement, SEL, health monitoring. I think, Karen, I got your entire list. I did. Um, and you need me to repeat it? Student attendance, health monitoring. Student attendance achievement, uh, SEL, and health monitoring. That's obviously a big focus. It's not just getting the kids in school, but making sure they're okay all around. All right, next up is leadership and management. Um, so I'm gonna harken back to our, uh, our review, Tony. Um, delegating to cabinet members, delegating to your team. I know it's hard, uh, you know, but this is your team. We want, you to, we want you to free yourself up a little bit to focus on some big picture stuff. 
Um, you know, one of the other things is uh, professional development for all staff. Um, certainly we offer a lot of it. Is it the right stuff? Um, you know, I know you've looked at the different models we use, but now we got to start looking at the content. Is it, is it what we need people to be getting? Um, I'm probably paraphrasing too much of what you wrote, but uh, aligning to needs and structural supports coaching. One of the big takeaways from special, from the special ed audit for me was that we don't do enough development for our staff. So there's a handoff between uh, between uh, gen ed teachers and everybody else. So anything, anything anybody wants to add on leadership and management? And obviously you can go back and uh, think about our, our review, but we, you know, we want to make sure that you have that time um, to do the things you need to do. Uh, community relations. So, uh, you know, I think this is a big one um, that we also talked about, which is getting you out into the community. Obviously COVID's made that a little bit difficult, but finding those opportunities for you to get out there, uh, whether it's uh, PTA meetings, whether it's the Retired Men's Association, but finding ways for you to connect with the community, uh, sporting events to the extent uh, you know crowds are allowed, that would be great. Um, you know, continuing to uh, to build trust as you do through continued communications, all the transparency. I know it's it's appreciated by many, um, so we'll continue to do that. Anything on community relations? Anybody, Dr. Francis? I see your hand. All right, I think the last one was the data one. Is that yes? Uh, that was a that? that was a couple ago. Sorry. So yeah, on, I'm sorry. On my list, it was the last one, so I, I got caught off guard. So on the data one, I also wanted to add. I mean, I know you. It says there to look at individualized learning. Um, you know, we had had a goal a while ago in terms of mastery based learning. Um, I understand at least that it seems like the math, the new math system, um, does lend itself to that. I don't know much about the link it. I mean, I know the star testing was supposed to be adaptive. So I just feel like our use of data ultimately should be to um, enhance the learning for every student and that that data is allowing students to move at their pace and the appropriate pace to maximize their learning. So I, I just wanted to understand if that's what you meant by individualized. Hang on one second. Do you remember what number it was, Gaetan? I think it's goal, goal four. I think it's goal, it's, I think it was a Growth, goal, it's, four, it's goal four, and it says it's, provide it's, access to real-time data to support individualized learning. And you're asking, the question is what? Is, are you basically, is this basically talking about kids moving at their own pace? So is it using this so, so we're, we're promoting the mastery-based learning and, and is link it and are those things are we, are we moving forward on that process, I guess, really is the question. I mean, are we getting better at using data to, to promote mastery-based learning? I think we're getting better at using data because we have the data. So the testing that we had before, um, even, even with something like STAR, didn't drill down enough um, for the teachers to really understand in a very easy way which standards students had mastered and which ones they hadn't. With Linkit, last year was the first year we utilized it, but I think it was... Um, the perfect year actually being in COVID because when we came back after the spring, we were able to give the, give the students an assessment and be able to see exactly what they had mastered from the previous year. And so teachers could really target at an individual level those standards that students really needed. And then if you have a student that if they've already mastered, let's say the current year, it's fourth grade, you give them Lincoln in September, October, and they've already mastered 85% of it, they really shouldn't be sitting there doing just fourth grade level work. So that's that's what that goal is speaking to. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Kelly? Just one on uh, information out to the public. Uh, emphasize the positive. We've got some great stuff going on in the schools. And sometimes it's little nuggets of positivity that exist that only a parent or other parents might know or a coach that's at the school or a teacher might know about. If we can maybe cast that net and pull those little nuggets of uh, positivity out of our school and make sure we communicate to that to our community, that would be a great thing because I know there's lots of things that are going on in our school that are really exciting. All right, so uh, just touching on the list of other items that uh, that I received from uh, board members. So we'll start with achievement gap, just because we, we did park it. Um, you know, the question is, Tony, whether or not this makes sense for a, a specific goal for you. It's been a while since we've had an actionable plan. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but, uh, but it is something that's out there. 
just in general on how we're focused on student achievement? Well, or how we're addressing the specific achievement gap. I mean, Ms. Kowalski points to the linked data showing gaps, and we've seen it before when we had SBA data, uh, you know, where, where students are underperforming at, at certain schools or within certain uh, classes. So we just want to figure out how we can how we can start tackling that, or, or if we are tackling it, showing evidence of, of progress. I think we are tackling it. However, I will say in COVID, I think it's, it's we're going to be in a different ballgame. We've done really well, but we know there are some pockets of students um, who per perhaps didn't come to school as often last year for a variety of family reasons. You won't really see it systemically, but we do drill down to the individual student. Um, and that's where we really see you know, the gap closing. And I still go back and you look at where Western was um, when we got those results in the fall of 19. Um, they had already, they'd closed the achievement gap. Um, all three middle schools were performing at the same level. And I think to get back to that, we have a lot of work to do over this next year and a bit because some of our students in our Title I schools had a different experience in COVID um, than some of our other families. All right, I guess to, to the board, does everybody feel that this ought to be a, a specific call out goal for Tony or is it something we wanna get an update uh, you know, from, from the administration at some point? So those are the two easiest ways to go about it. So look into the board. Ms. Hirsch. I was just gonna say, I think that it, two of the other goals that she's, that Dr. Jones has already written up, it was, is, one is curriculum and one is uh, link it, which is data. I think they can, there can be a separate bullet point built into there um, unless, you know, you know that, that's just a thought, I, I just, you know. All right, Ms. Stowe. So I agree with that sentiment. I think the overall has to be moving all of our students forward. And that's clear that you understand that that's the goal. Um, we should keep looking at this data as often as we can. And maybe we should work it more into our agenda planning. But I don't know if it needs to be distinctive because I think it's within some of these other goals. Dr. Francis. Um, yeah, I, I guess for one, I agree. I think um, student achievement should be clearly a goal overall. I, I guess actually as I was rereading the, the data one, to me, it's not just sort of to see what happened with COVID. I think it should be, you know, the goal is to maximize student achievement for all students. And certainly the achievement gap should be part of that. And, and I think the impacts of COVID or other issues separate from COVID that, that may impact the, uh, the achievement gap, I think that certainly could be a sub bullet in there. And I think to make that goal overall stronger in terms of just maximizing student achievement. Ms. Downey. I mean, this isn't necessarily a goal, but I do, you know, in the past, we've done kind of a data workshop as a board. Um, I know I saw, so I think on our October agenda, maybe. So are we, is that the plan is we'll do, because sometimes we've done it as a standalone. Um, so I think we don't want to shortchange the information once we actually get it, because I know last year we didn't have it. So food for thought, it's not necessarily a goal, but just kind of ties into Karen's point about getting the data and having an opportunity for us to roll up our sleeves and really look at where our students are across the board. So, Karen. So I just, I think there's just, perhaps it's just beeping, beefing up goal four specifically because one, I don't think it should be limited to students during COVID-19. I think we have to look at it as a, a systemic issue across the board and not limited to, to COVID. And I think we are, but I, I, the words don't say that. The, the other issue is when I look at the, the piece where it says my specific comments are, right, this is, this seems to me to be, you know, providing information about data, but not actually doing something with the data. So it would, I would, you know, for example, point one, provide access to real-time data um, to support individualized learning, find, expand common assessment opportunities through K-12. I actually don't even know what that means. Um, and then three, continue migration for a strong parent portal. But none of that sings to me as we're actually, we're, we're taking steps further to actually enhance education and address the achievement gaps that we're seeing. And I, perhaps there's a stronger way of saying that. 
All right. If I'm hearing what everybody's saying, I think achievement gap is a standalone goal, probably not necessary, but embedding it within the existing goals, as well as making sure when we do agenda planning, Kathleen, you're going to have to keep me on that, uh, that we make sure that, especially when we get data, that we get specific call-outs for achievement gap. Make sense? Can I, can I yep. Dr. Question? Jones, you may speak. I do want to say one thing about the data. So when I went back through several of the data reports, I if... If you go back several years ago, we did get very granular. We are not supposed to do that. And so I, I just wanna be really clear that we can go down to a certain level, but we don't even get state reporting you know, past a certain number of students. So it does depend on the building. We will drill down as much as we can and continue to take feedback on that. But I, I do know if you've seen some previous reports and it would have like four children on there, we, we are not supposed to do that. So I just wanna be really transparent up front about that. We also have a board policy about data, so we just do need to be cognizant of it. That's a good point. Um, all right, I had uh, somebody ask about strategic plan. Um, in my mind, that's more of a board goal, quite frankly, that's partnership with the superintendent, but that is not a superintendent goal. That is something the board needs to, to step into. And uh, given where we are, I think it's probably something the next board is going to be stepping into. I don't know if anybody disagrees or wants to say something about strategic plan. Karen? I'll just, um, I, I don't necessarily dis disagree. I think I raised it as, as, a, as, as something that we need to get done as a board, but I think the, the concept there is um, the partnership of, and then the implementation going forward, right? We as a board can come up with a strategic plan, but we have to have a goal uh, go, you know, it's not our goal and it's not our job to implement it. And so that's what I was making reference to. I think the strategic plan, yes, is on us and that needs to be taken up as an early action item going forward um, in, the, in the fall, absolutely. But um, I think it needs to be backstopped by the understanding that it needs to be implemented as well. Yep, totally agree with you. It's gotta be done in partnership with the superintendent though for that to be effective. All right, Dr. Francis. Sorry, I, I will, uh, I'm just basically saying I agree. That was one of the things I had written in, partly just to see, because I'm out of it, where where we were with that. But I agree that does need to start with the board and then would be a partnership from there or at a minimum, maybe should be a board goal or something to start from there. So I agree. Thank you. All right, the next uh, two, I'm going to bucket under finance. So one is just the, uh, the use of the federal funding. Um, you know, I don't think it's called out anywhere. I don't really think it fits in anywhere, but it is obviously, uh, it is something that you end up responsible for in terms of making sure that it's going to the right things, that we're using it in the right way, uh, that we don't trip over ourselves. So that's, that's one, and I don't know if that needs to be a standalone goal. Um, and the other one that was suggested was around infrastructure. So it's maintenance, capital investment, and ADA. Um, and so, you know, maybe a, a, just a general finance goal or a budget goal, but, but building those into it, because I think those are sadly a very big, important part of the job you do probably takes more time than it ought to. Um, I know Sean has been a great asset, but, you know, at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. And so I, I, I think it's probably worthy of a goal, but I, I'll, I'll leave it to others to, uh, to disagree or whatever. Ms. Stowe. I was, I suggested it. So I'm, I'm as boring as it is. Um, I think it's important. And especially with all this additional federal money coming in, which, you know, is appreciated. We need to make sure we spend those funds wisely. So I think we should make it a goal. Ms. Kowalski. I added, I had the piece regarding the ADA piece and spending money, making sure the appropriate funds were um, allocated there. So I, I agree with, with Ms. Stowe. We, we need to have a broader financial goal that there are specific things that we make sure are targeted in the next plan going forward and how that money is spent. And I think that goes to the broader also just general capital piece, right? You guys have been doing amazing work kind of keeping the capital projects on 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 track and just ADA has got to be a, a just a big part of that as well. All right. Um, I think that's it. If you, you know, want to work on that, if you have questions, obviously board member, you can reach out to individual board members. Ms. Hirsch. There was one other one that I suggested, and I know I we briefly discussed it earlier today at the uh, PGC meeting was just last year we were working through updating, um, going through all of our policies to bring them forward. Um, as well as the regulations. And I would love to just somewhere in there, maybe that would be under 
um, some other goal just to make sure that we are continue adding that as a goal to continue moving forward with those regulations. I mean, that that's whether you give them to other members of the department, but it makes no sense for us to have the policies updated if the regulations are not as well. So, because that's how we, how we function as a board and a, a district. So that was the only other one I added. All right, Dr. Francis. I just was gonna second that as, you know, prior member of PGC. Um, in, in fact, I remember actually Barbara O'Neill would talk about, you know, the anxiety of as a district having a policy, but then not having the regulations or the implementation to back it up. And then you're really creating a problem within your district that your policy says one thing, but your actions are not following through. So I do think those regulations uh, do need to be, uh, whether created or arranged or organized or whatever it needs to be, but so that those things happen. All right. I say something? No, Dr. Yeah, of course, Dr. Jones. So I, it feels like we're putting everything but the kitchen sink in the goals. And so, and, and I'm, I'm okay in that I, I realize all of these different components are critically important, but when I bring you the goals, I really am trying to laser focus on the top priority for me. We have an entire team and an amazing team, but really what, what I'm hearing is that you would almost rather see a work plan from me, which is in another district, that's what I did. You know, I brought my work plan to the board. Then you saw the capital and facilities, you saw the finance, you saw the curriculum and everything that we were committing to do for the year, which is a little bit different process than goals like this. And I just want to share that because by the time I go back and rework this, I'm going to have all these different buckets that it really, I mean, it is a team effort, but it's really more like we're trying, we're putting the work plan. So I just, I share that with as I'm listening, because just asking these your opinion are... on what do you think with process wise, which, which, you know, a work plan versus, you know, top three, four, whatever the number is, you know, in terms of how you and your team can function, just kind of if you could speak to pros and cons of one approach versus the other. I mean, I think everybody has to have kind of the action plan, work plan for, so they know what, what the goal is for all of the different departments. And I will say a lot of what's on here, the team is flying with already. Um, you know, I look at some of the curriculum work that's happened this summer. We're, we're doing all of these things, um, but it's, it, it is different if you want a document that has all of those components on it from here's what we're committing to, or here's the timeline, like, uh, P, like the PCG is a goal. We've got to work on that, but that's not a one-year goal. You know, we're, it, we have to be able to say, here's what we've already done. Here's the plan, but it's going to take us, you know, through the next 24 months at least, and maybe a year longer than that on some components. So in a work plan, you would see that because you would see June of 23 or June of 24 out besides something that we're accomplishing that we're working on this current year. So it's just a different approach. Uh, maybe we can try to find the, the middle ground, Tony, and, and figure out how to beef up the items that are already on your on yours, yeah. and then list out the other items as more work plan, just so that you're not completely rewriting this. And we, we get to see both. But we'll vote on the goals, obviously, but we'll understand the other work is ongoing. Right. Right, Ms. Stowe? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, hopefully, like, we're kind of taking ALP a little bit off your plate, right? We're putting that to us. And then even with the finance thing. I mean, that really should be almost a sub bill now that I think about it. So org systems and safety, right? ADA, um, finance, operations, CapEx. So I know it's all within it. So maybe that's more of a work plan, but you're right. The answer is probably somewhere in between. We don't want to I say the COVID goal. I hope it's just this one year goal. I, I don't want to see this again. Okay. But I think it's important that it be on there because I know because everybody's worn out from COVID, but the reality is for the teachers, for the administrators, for our children, we're all coming back into a very incredibly difficult environment. And um, we're facing a lot of the same challenges that we're, we, we know a little more this year, but with this variant, it's also very different. So there's a lot we don't know, but it is disappointing. <laughs> so on the ALP, the, I, I think I, I would ask for clarity on that because I think from the team perspective and just the comments we got last year and working with PTA as well, PTA had asked for that, that study. And so, you know, we did it and it was done. I think it was the spring before I started. 
And when the results, we don't necessarily say that everything that's in there and the recommendations are what, what we're asking to do, but there's already a committee that is formulated. You know, they're planning to meet regularly throughout the year to go through and talk about, because that's what we thought the board actually wanted us to do, was to be able to, I think, I think we're saying the same thing, but uh, is it a state of art program? You know, what is it that, that, we, wanted, that we want to look at for out? Is a super block, you know, something that's good. That's something that just emerged in the last 12 months. But if what I'm hearing here is you're like, just take it off or I think I need clarity so that, cause I know that probably, and, and if Mark's on, he can chime in as well because I know he's worked with Bonnie on this too, but I, I need clarity on what the board wants us to do with help. I'm I, I think it's probably more of a work plan item than a, than a goal item. I think it's some, we want to hear the results of the work that they're doing, but obviously we were not on board with the changes that were recommended in the previous report. So I think this further information will help us kind of get to where we need to go. And the board can have a discussion with you as to the future growth of the L program but in a positive way. Yeah. Ms. Downey. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy that the committee is doing work. I'm not sure I know what the committee's focus is. I think we walked away from that meeting with kind of a lot of balls in the air and to the extent we know like what they're focusing on, right? I mean, I don't, I don't, I guess I speak for other board members. I don't think I know what they're focusing on. And and before they undertake a, a bunch of work, we would like to know what their they believe their mission and, and task is so that we're all, if they are conducting work that we want them to do, that it's the work we want done. So I don't know some communication of that to get the process going. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. I wasn't going to say anything because I'm confused on this topic, but I decided at the risk of looking dumb, I'm going to say something. I want to be the number one school district in the state. Okay. How do we become the number one school district in the state? That should be our goal. Okay. What takes us to the number one school district in the state? People have quoted us as being ranked number seven. Who ranked us and what did they use to rank us to be number seven? These are probably a lot of the components that we need to set or put in front of you as goals for you to achieve because we want to win the championship. We want to win. We want to be the number one school district in the state. I don't know how to get there. I don't know how they rank us and I don't know how they decide that. I'd like to find out how it, that is decided. And I think we set our goals based on how that's decided in addition to the things we just talked about. And as I said, I didn't want to risk looking dumb, so I wasn't going to say anything. But basically, there are a lot of components that we just talked about, but it seems kind of vague on the direction and how to hold you accountable to the various things we just talked about. But certainly there's a, uh, a standard that somehow is kept that says we're number seven, number eight, number six, whatever we are. Let's find out what it takes to be number one and, and go for being number one. And then we'll put the goals in line with that. And, and it is complex in education, unfortunately, um, because it depends whether you're looking at US News, are you looking at state rankings, are you looking at the niche? There's so many different ranking systems. Some of them will go in and look at your demographics and give you, you know, a value point for that and then where you are assessing. Some of them will go in and just look at straight SVAC scores and they compare districts that in you know, in Connecticut, they're called DERGs, like a, a district that's more um, diverse. We have more EL learners that um, are assessing and they're in their third year learning English, comparing to a district where they don't have EL students. Um, everyone speaks English and they're taking the same reading assessment. So it is hard. Um, I think we all want to be number one. And I think it's, you have to go through and maximize each component so that, you know, you're really, when doesn't matter which system you're looking at, you're trying to maximize what you get out of it. So if your graduation rate may count more on one than it does another, but you still want to maximize your graduation rate. So we definitely have things to work on. So can't we say that the goal is, we all have the same goal in line uh, to be the best school district. Cause you said, there's a lot of factors that are involved that are important. And we analyze those factors and then use a, uh, the ability to, to take that information and hold you, put those goals in front of you to try to achieve these things. Uh, it, it seems simple, but as you said, you understand those dynamics. I don't. And I know we're throwing a lot of things at you and you're saying they belong in one basket, maybe belong in a different basket. They belong as a, uh, as a board goal uh, rather than a superintendent goal. But if we all have the same common denominator. If we want to be the number one school district in the state 
and you said you understand the dynamics and how to get there. Let's work backwards on how do we get to be number one and work on what will have us, what achievements we'll have in the different categories we're talking about. And if we're fifth in this and ninth in that and, and third in that, at least we know what categories we're competing in so we can understand what your goals should be because your goals can simply be evaluated uh, by our rankings going higher and lower based on the information you just talked about. Does that make sense? It does, but I don't want to be tied to a ranking. I think there's a lot more to a school district than where you're ranked. And if you if we went in that direction, we would probably lose a lot of good staff because it's pretty, I mean, it's if you really want test prep, we can put workbooks on every desk. Um, you, you know, drill and drill and drill. And um, I remember my first year in Connecticut, there was a district that was performing really well, looked at what they were doing. That's exactly what they were doing. And it was here in Fairfield County. Would I want, would I want my child in a classroom like that? No. So I think it's really being analytical about it. And we, we really do have a great team of people. And I know they're watching tonight and they're listening. So we will go back and, and look at kind of all these different things that the board has said and um, try to communicate better about what we're doing. I've got Thank you, Francis. Hi. So uh, I just actually want to respond to that before to bringing up what I was going to say. Um, my concern is that if your goal is to be ranked number one, you want to be really careful about who's doing the ranking. And I'm not convinced that most of the people who are doing the ranking are valuing the things that I would value. Um, and so I, 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 I hesitate to do that. Uh, I, I do want our school district to be outstanding in so many ways, but I don't know that I want to value it the way some external person is doing that. Um, that was actually not what I wanted to say. So I'm sorry, let me say what I wanted to say, which was with the ALP, I'm, a, I'm on the fence. And I think I said this before about whether this should be a superintendent goal or not. But my concern is that I'm not sure there's a clear sense of what the board wants that goal to be. Um, and so, I, and I think actually, Christina, most of what you said, I really liked. So I think I will just ditto most of that. But just to say, um, I think we want to be careful if there's something that's moving forward, that it doesn't then keep going and then come back to the board and the board's like, no, that's not what we want at all. So I just think we wanna be careful if we're making that a goal, given that, I mean, I have not been in the loop, but my understanding is that there was a report and I was starting to look at it, that, that that's not necessarily what the board wants to achieve. Um, so I think we would wanna be really careful to give you a goal, but, but it's not clear what we actually wanna have as the outcome. Ms. Hirsch. Um, I will say, uh, in reference to rankings, I think everything that we've asked for are the, are the things that make our district so incredible, uh, and why we do so well here. Um, so Joe, we are, we are looking for that. We're just not looking for a specific number on that, I think, but I, I agree with, I understand where you were going. Um, when it comes to ALP, I think again, before we delve into it, it, it we had this discussion back in January and it never came back to the board. Um, some of the things that were in that plan at the very end, the end goal was to, one of the work plans, and I, my guess is what the, they might be working on as a committee, was something that the board said was not necessarily our understanding of the goal of the program. And that's why back in January, we said, we as a board need to have an understanding and a discussion and a board decision as to what we feel that that program should be what it needs to be addressing, um, you know, uh, you know, before they start to make changes. Changes certainly are, are always welcome when, you know, they're positive. And, and we're, I know that's what the goal here ultimately is. But I think prior to that, I know it's on our October agenda that maybe that is a before they start to dig in and do a, a heck of a lot of work. You know, we, there were some data points that we had sort of asked for before we moved forward. We still haven't seen those either. Um, I'm happy to go back to uh, the minutes and the notes I took at that meeting and, and uh, pull from that to share with the board and they can see if that's uh, what, you know, how you guys want to proceed. Ms. Kowalski. Um, my additional guidance on the out piece is that it shouldn't be a goal at all. It, it shouldn't be on the list. And I think everyone has uh, articulated themselves quite, quite nicely as that the board has something entirely different in mind. Karen said it, Ms. Hirsch said it very well. Uh, I think we as a board need to understand, as, as Ms. Downey said, what this committee is doing and the direction that they're headed in, because I don't want to put a goal that I'm not quite sure 
any of us know what it is and have you achieve it. And one, we haven't, and we don't want you to do that without uh, and as a board and vote on it. So um, my, my recommendation is take out off of the goals. It becomes an item we talk about in October and perhaps we can give some direction again with, uh, with a board liaison or representative on that committee to make sure that we're getting the most out of the volunteers that would like to see the out program taken to another level. All right. Uh, thank you everybody for that, Tony. I know we've dropped a lot on you as always, <laughs> um, but uh, we can always answer questions in the meantime, and then we will uh, attempt to be able to in a, be in a position to vote on goals September 9th, of course, knowing that you're already working on all of them anyway. And not one of those things is something that is not being looked at or talked about. So thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is an action item uh, it relates to the Julian Curtis Ed Specs. I'm making this motion for the sheer purpose of putting it on the table for discussion. If we need to amend this motion, we will do so. Uh, but I'm going to move to reaffirm the education specifications for the Julian Curtis School Project adopted at the December 3rd, 2020 Board of Education meeting. Is there a second for that, Mr. Kelly? All right, discussion. So. Uh, we put forward ed specs uh, that we voted on at our meeting last December as part of our capital budget. We made a request to the BET for the next tranche of funding in order to get a building committee established and let them start working, much like the vestibule committee. Uh, the BET budget committee and then through the full BET had a discussion about whether or not uh, they supported that project in its entirety as put forward. Uh, they ended up reducing our capital request to about $200,000. I believe our capital request, if you'll bear with me, I've got like 20 documents open and I think I just, I think it was actually 1.7, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, we had a, a larger request uh, for for to be able to get an architect and start the design work. The BET cut it back, uh, basically saying in a very public way that they did not like, not, not all of the BT, certain BT members did not like the ed specs, that there were things in there that were nice to have as opposed to must haves. Uh, and I believe they were referring to the science room, uh, the pre-K rooms, uh, basically inviting us to revisit our ed spec. So that is where we are tonight. And the question before this board is whether or not we want to revisit our ed specs. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna open the floor to discussion. Ms. Kowalski. So I, I have, sorry, I have to remember to hold this thing down. Um, I, so I have a procedural question. So if, aren't they already approved? So why would we have to reaffirm anything? Wouldn't it just be a matter of a vote we decide when we decide to whether or not we're adding this to our capital budget when we go through the budgetary process in November and December? As I said, when I made the motion, it was to get the item on the floor for discussion. Uh, procedurally, uh, you were correct in the instance that these ed specs were adopted. If we do nothing, these are still our ed specs uh, and they would move forward. I, I think from my point of view, I wanna let the BET know where this board stands in terms of the ed specs. I would much rather take a vote. We could do nothing. Uh, I chose to phrase the motion in the affirmative because according to Robert's rules, you should always have an affirmative motion. If somebody wants to make a motion to reopen the ed specs, they certainly can, uh, can move to make an amendment. But my, my point of view is it is the Board of Ed's responsibility to determine the education specifications for school building. We made that determination last December after multiple, multiple meetings. We took into account uh, the committee's views, we took into account the administration's views, the board's views, the community's views. At that point, we made a decision as to what we felt was necessary in the building, not nice to have, but necessary in the building. Um, you know, we looked at our master facility plan, we looked at the goals of that plan, which included health and safety, ADA. It also included undersized common spaces. It included other things that were missing from buildings or needed to be replaced. I think people have lost the focus on what their master facility plan called for. We spent a lot of time on this project, just as we spent a lot of time on OG, which we're gonna vote on those ed specs soon. It really is our responsibility to decide what goes in the ed specs. The BET's responsibility per the town charter is to decide how to finance such things. So if the BET has a has a uh, opinion on the dollar figure, they have the ability to basically adjust the dollar figures. That's something we can't do. We can't 
we can't just say we're going to go build this and pretend that we don't have to worry about the money, but the BET has to think about that part of it. So it's our job to, to figure out what's in the building. I think we've spoken. Um, if there are members that want to speak for or against changing the ed specs, this is our opportunity to do it. But this is basically the, the, the time for us to do that. Uh, by reaffirming the ed specs, we basically are signaling to the administration, we expect this to be part of your capital request for next year, uh, because they are already working on building the budget for next year. I think waiting on that doesn't serve anybody. So I'll open it up for other discussion. Ms. Kowalski. So with respect to the, your comment, uh, I think that's better. Thank you. With respect to the comment regarding the, the BET and the amount of, of money, is it really their decision on the amount of money? Because once we settle on the ed specs, the ed specs are gonna cost what they cost. So if we put forward ed specs and they say, well, those ed specs, and we generally come up with a budgetary number on what those we think those are based upon, the designs put into place, then let's say it's $20 million using round numbers, and we go to the BET with these ed specs and we think they're going to, it's, to build it will cost 20 million, then they say it's too much. But the ed specs are still there. So they say, no, we'll give you 15 million. But our ed specs are already passed. So how do we, how do we work the fact that we have ed specs that cost 20 million, but let's say the BET gives us 15? So at that point, we'd have to have a discussion about what we feel is, is going to fit within that. I will tell you there's precedent for this. Uh, when we put forward our ed specs for the new Lebanon school, there were those on the BET that felt like there were too many classrooms going into the new Lebanon school. Rather than telling the Board of Ed to cut a classroom, what they did is they cut $300,000 because they figured on the square footage that was what a classroom was and they wanted one classroom removed. We were actually able, the building committee was actually able to build that project with the amount of classrooms that the Board of Ed had in the ed specs for the budgeted amount. So it can be done. There is precedent for it. Uh, I was a little surprised that the BET didn't take that approach when they, uh, when they came to it in, uh, in the spring. I will say I've had zero outreach from any BET member about this since they voted. Uh, it's been on our agenda. We're not hiding from it. We, in fact, had our, our agenda has been out there for a while. Um, you know, we needed to deal with this and that's, that's where we are. We want to get this resolved so that we can have the capital plan put, uh, put together. We're going to get that at the beginning of, uh, of November, but we'll probably, our budget committee will probably be meeting with the administration even before that. So they need, uh, the administration needs a signal from us how to move forward. And this will, this will help do that. Other discussion? Yes, sir. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, I feel similarly uh, to you, Mr. Bernstein. I, I, there was, Seeing as how no new information has been brought forward to us to us why uh, we would need to change those ed specs, uh, we voted on those and I, I think that uh, our vote sort of stands as that is what it is. We made promises to the community uh, as to what we were going to give them when we made those made that vote and um, I think we should if we need to reaffirm that vote now. Uh, that's fine, but um, that I agree with you. Ms. Kowalski. So I was just curious, what are Julian Curtis's numbers for students going in um, this year. Where where are we at? I, I don't know that Dr. Jones has that, but certainly we can get that. We don't get our enrollment numbers until uh, after the school year started because they still fluctuate. Right, but what what are we projecting for this year based upon what we know? Because I think they happen. They fluctuate so often. And I think you guys get weekly reports on where we're at with numbers because we got to decide on classrooms. Are we adding? Are we not? That. So I'm yeah. just curious as to where we think we are and projected on number. I do not have that with me tonight. Um, I can try to see if I can find it on my phone. But, but I guess let me respond to that in a different fashion. We aren't putting any additional K-5 classrooms in that building, right? We are not looking at the enrollment of that building and saying we're trying to add more space because they're bursting at the seams. We have other elementary schools. We, we will be looking at that uh, when we get to them, Riverside for one. Uh, but we are not looking at that for JC. So the, the current enrollment is an interesting figure, but it's not the deciding figure for what we're trying to accomplish with this project. In fact, if you go back and you look at the master facilities plan, there were 
calls for additional classrooms and trying to change every building in a major way. We're actually not doing that. We actually decided to go in a different direction. So enrollment's interesting, but it's not the be all end all. Ms. Downey. Um, I agree with virtually everything you said, Peter, that we've, we looked at this ad nauseum is my recollection. We had many meetings about these and we made a decision. There's no additional or new information to change our educational specifications. I think it's a good, it, the BET is kind of thrown, this is not typical when they throw it back to us to look at it, but I think taking an affirmative vote is appropriate and we should go ahead and do so and move along. Joe likes to call it. I would like to call the question. All right, we're going to call the question. So the motion on the table is to reaffirm the ed specification, the education specifications for the Julian Curtis School adopted at the December 3rd, 2020 Board of Education meeting. Uh, so because we've got Gaetan online, we're going to go ahead and take a roll call vote. Uh, so I'll start at this end. Ms. Hirsch? Yes. Bernstein? Yes. Stowe? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kowalski? For all the reasons I stated in the December 23rd meeting now. December 3rd, we'll, we'll make sure the, the record's clear. Third, sorry. That's okay. Dr. Francis? Yes. yes. All right, so that passes 6-1, uh, share absent. Uh, I'm sorry, 6-1, no, 6-1, six, one. Six, one. we have eight members, one, one absent. <laughs> All right, so that is our last agenda item for the evening. Uh, board members, I will remind you, we are committed to a meeting at 6 p.m. on Thursday, the 26th, uh, to deal with the policy. Um, and then we will be meeting September 9th. Yes, Ms. Downey. Um, we didn't talk about, I think you and I, I guess, can have an offline conversation on the motions vis-a-vis -vis the entryway in terms of whether it has to go before the art. I realized oh, we didn't talk about yeah, that. Sorry, yes, you're, yeah, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. And those were on, on the cover sheet, just to circle back to that. Yeah. Um, so people know and are aware when we're voting on the ninth. Uh, in order to authorize uh, the request to the state for additional funding for the entryway project, because we'll be seeking further reimbursement, we have to pass two motions. Those motions are attached to this. If you have any questions about them, reach out to Christina, uh, and we will take those up when we vote on the design on the 9th. And, and well, we, as I said, we can have it offline. Um, Steve Walker and I spoke about whether we actually even need to make those motions that we need to have some discussion about. Maybe they're running this by the town attorney's office. Great. Can we do that? All right, Ms. Stowe. Otherwise, if, if there's a rush to this, I mean, why wouldn't you just add this to the August 26th? I think we want to give people, you know, I, I believe me, we'd love to keep it moving, but I think we should give people an opportunity to really look at the drawings and people in the community, don't you think? I mean, it, three days feels a little rushed for that. It's one thing to for something that we need for the start of school. Um, that, maybe that if we were meeting in a week and a half, I'd say it's one thing, but three days from now, I yeah, think that, it's that asking a lot of people today. for some. All right, with that, Mr. Kelly, did you have a motion? Yes, I would like to make a motion to adjourn. I will second that motion, Hirsch. Yes. Bernstein, yes. Stowe? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Downey? Yes. Kowalski? Yes. And Francis? Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.